Um, first of all, I'm going to talk about a new topic, signal processing and machine learning. For us, it's a very new topic, EEG signal analysis. And uh, we have set up an EEG lab. And one of the things all of you are familiar, may be familiar with what EEG is. I'll talk a little bit about that. And you know, you take an EEG signal if you have fallen and you know, you've hurt, if you didn't, didn't wear a helmet, hurt yourself, which is a very common thing going by a, you know, motorbike or whatever it may be. First thing that they will do is if you have a concussion, let's get an EEG done to see if there's any defect. Normally, EEG signals have been used primarily for detecting anomalies in the brain. One of the things that we are, we are talking about is we are looking at it primarily from a very different perspective, looking at normal human beings, and we will see why this is necessary. So what I'm going to do is, um, this is kind of an outline. Can I have a pointer, please? This is kind of an outline to the talk. And uh, bear with me if I have made some mistakes. I've brought my PhD students along to help me out. Mari, Rimi, and uh, Siddhartha are here to help me out in case I goof up. And because most of the experiments are what they have performed, and if you ask me some details, and I'm not able to give it to you, uh, they will be able to help you with this. Many of the results that I'm presenting today are kind of novel. Not much of the literature is there on EEG for, uh, for gainful processing of EEG signals. So I'll talk to you a little bit about the lab that we have set up and what is an EEG signal. Then my primary uh, expertise is in audio. So one of the things that we are looking at is audio <coughs> perception. So I'll talk about speech and uh, EEG. That is, if you look at the audio signal speech, how does the corresponding EEG signal when you are actually listening look like? And can we understand what you are listening to? That's the objective. Then another thing that came up was when we were working on the speech and EEG signals, um, we had a lot of difficulty in getting to understand what was being learned. One thing was we thought, you know, most of our volunteers are students and they suffer from attention deficiency disorder. So we blamed it on that for a long while. And then we realized actually that's not really so, but there is actually a lot of person information in the EEG. Each person's EEG is unique. There is a subject specific characteristics in the EEG. Then we did a lot of work on person identification using EEG. And then finally, it turns out, you know, there's always a byproduct of all of this. And you can actually use it as a nice biometric which cannot be spoofed. Your voice can be spoofed. You know, your uh, face, your picture can be presented to a camera. Your fingerprint, somebody can use gum to use your, uh, to produce your fingerprint. Whereas EEG, you cannot spoof. So it turns out that it's a good biometric, actually. Then. The next problem that we looked at was when we look at any specific task, the idea is to build what are called brain-computer interfaces. So directly, the brain signal should control the wheelchair, should control anything that we want to speak. B for whom are we doing this? We are primarily, our primary objective is to build assistive technologies for people with motor disability. The person may be paralyzed. Cerebral palsy is a very good example where the person has all the thoughts in their head, but you know cannot articulate. Okay, so can, and so we have to get rid of these artifacts. And so first thing what we have to do is can we first of all identify the some artifacts is what we have looked at. We I must warn you that we are taking baby steps in this. So there are some the experiments may look a little bit scattered. I'm only showing you the experiments on which we've got some results. This is primarily to show that EEG has information They're relevant to the task. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. We have been working with EEG signals for the last one and a half years. We set up the lab, we started collecting data, and motor and mental. Can we distinguish between motor and mental tasks? So something called single trial P300 classification was basically the oddball paradigm. You're seeing various things and suddenly there is an event. I mean, to give you an example, 
the cricket match is going on right now. Um, and you know, suddenly there is a person who gets out or somebody who hits a six, then the P300 should kick in and you should see a positive slope, okay? And these are the things that we are looking at. Can we detect these events? That's what the oddball paradigm using P300 is. And EEG for motor and mental tasks, classification, we have done these two tasks at IIT. And I'll just, uh, you know, run you through this, but please bear with me that we are actually taking baby steps. We still got into CCBR three, four years ago, and we were working on mouse brain data uh, um, in collaboration with uh, Professor Mrigan Kasur of MIT. And then, you know, we work, since coming from the computer science department, we all do a lot of big data analytics. So we wanted the same mouse and repeated data. Uh, laser pointer is good if you can. This one, right? Okay. So, oh, you can't connect it. Okay. I'll just use it. So what we did was we, um, then we found that we can't work with the same mouse data, for example, when we wanted it, many times the mouse is even dead. So we can't collect the same data. Then we said, you know, being belonging to the computer science department, we are primarily uh, people who do a lot of big data analytics. Then we decided we will set up an EEG lab and we'll have student volunteers to collect the data. And that's what, that's where this whole thing started about. So that's why I'm saying we hardly know anything about EEG. So as I said already, it's the idea is to build brain-computer interfaces. It's a promising technology that enables humans to control external devices by modulating uh, brain waves. And there are examples of EEG-based BCI ap applications, including that of a bird speller program and wheelchair controllers, okay? And um, this, what is electroencephalography? It is a technique that records the electrical activity of the human brain. First recordings were made as early as uh, 1929 on, human, on humans, on animals as early as 1870. And what do these waveforms reflect? The activity on the surface of the brain, the cortex, activity is influenced by the electrical activity underneath the cortex. So all of you have heard that neurons fire and these firings, but what we are looking at is not, you've been hearing a lot about single neuronal firings. Here we are talking about populations of neurons. So we are not getting single neuronal data here. So you're looking at populations of neurons. It's typically, and the most important point is it's non-invasive. There's something called an ECOG, which is actually placed underneath the scalp and these electrodes are placed along the scalp. And those of you who have gone through an EEG know that um, the ones that you, when you go to a clinic, for example, they will actually apply some gel into it and make it sit on your head. And just like dry solder, if you ensure that uh, it's not having a very high impedance, make sure that all the electrodes are active. And these nerve cells in the brain produce what are called action potentials and Action potentials move, move from cell to cell via the synapse, which you already know. And special chemicals called neurotransmitters help the signals move across the synapse. There are many, many different types of uh, neurotransmitters, but at the very gross level, you have one that inhibits and other that helps movement of action potentials to the next cell. And generally, they have an equal number of inhibitor and um, the other one that moves. EEG voltages are generally very, very small of the order of microvolts. That's also another problem that we have. So let me just show you the picture of the lab that we have. This is how you place, this is a net, this is an EEG net that is there. You place the net, each one of these is a microphone, and you just, um, the net is normally soaked in, the one that we have is a pretty sophisticated piece of equipment. It takes about 15 minutes to set up a person to use this. So you soak the net in saline water, it's actually wet EEG, and place the helmet on the head. And we present different kinds of stimuli. This person's eyes are closed, primarily because he is listening to audio data. The reason why we do this is if he keeps his eyes open, the person can get distracted. Audio, for example, I mean, these are, I'm assuming we have done very, very controlled experiments, 
And this is how the EEG signal looks like when the person is listening to some data. We have a 128 channel EEG system in our lab and the signals of interest are generally in the range of 0.3 to 30 hertz. Okay, I'll give you some meaning of what they mean a little later. And another thing, the, uh, the brain is, I did a little bit of picture about the brain. Cerebrum consists of the cerebrum, which is the largest, which is relevant for us. It is responsible for memory, attention, awareness, thought, language, and consciousness. Consists of four lobes primarily, a central lobe, which we really do not use, frontal lobe, parietal lobe, occipital lobe, and temporal lobe. Frontal road is just behind your forehead, responsible for cognitive functions, control of voluntary movement, speech, regulating emotion. Parietal lobe, movement, orientation, recognition, and perception. Occipital lobe is primarily for vision processing, it's at the back. And temporal lobe is central, so if you look at the lateral view, above the ears, interpreting sound and language and memory. Okay? So this is what your, um, picture of the lateral view of the brain is. This is the front, which is your, your behind your forehead, parietal lobe, temporal lobe, occipital lobe at the back. Okay? There's something called the thalamus, which I'm not talking about, which does all the control that is there in the brain. And now, we showed you this EEG net over here. So now what we have is, we have a map of the EEG, EEG net vis-a-vis -vis the various lobes that make up the brain. These are the uh, sensors which are placed on your head, or the microphones that are placed on your head, and these are the various lobes. Why is this important? If I'm looking at speech, for example, I might look at the temporal and parietal lobes, whereas if I'm looking at vision, for example, I might look at the occipital lobe sensors. I may not require other sensors to look at it. Okay. So this is the, um, we use what is called an anechoic chamber. This is not really required for EEG, but primarily because we do not want the person to be distracted. There's a room, eight by eight room, in which the person sits, and there's only the stimulus that they can listen to or watch a stimulus. And despite that, the mind wanders quite a lot. Okay, so this is something that we have done. And this is a picture of uh, what the, and as I said, the EEG, uh, this is your helmet on a mannequin over here. And there is an amplifier which amplifies the EEG signals that are captured. And um, there are, we have got two nets, and we have also purchased the third net. The point is, depending upon the head size, we have to use the appropriate net. You can't use any, uh, if there's nothing like a general free size t-shirt, you know. The, for the nets because it's required that you do not have large impedance where the signal cannot be measured. What are the applications of EEG? What you would have heard about is diagnose and monitor seizure disorders, ident identify areas of the brain which are not working, identify the level of brain activity, sleep disorders. It primarily, so far, EEG has been used to detect anomalies in the brain which have significantly different signatures from normal EEG. You know, so a human being, for example, a doctor can look at your EEG and say whether it is you have any anomaly or not. It's very easy to do that. But what we are looking at, of course, there are other issues with EEG, for example, in the context of epileptic fits. One of the things that people are, look, people are looking for is they do they remove part of the brain. That's what I've heard from a, a neurosurgeon. And the idea is, can we localize it? This still is a bit of an effort because you need experts with fMRI, MRI, and EEG to decide where is the location. And they want to do this non-invasive, and that is still an open problem. What we are looking at in the context of audition is to collect signals from normal subjects with speech and music as stimuli. And we analyze the same with signal processing and machine learning tools to build interesting BCI applications. That's our objective. In the context of speech, for example, we'd like to understand speech rhythm, which still is not there. Those of you who have used a Google Home, Amazon Alexa, Siri, whatever, you'll find that it does not talk to you many times with the right kind of emotion based on 
what you are looking for. So this is something that we would like to try and understand that is called speech prosody. And in the context of music, we would like to identify rhythm just like speech has rhythm. Music has rhythm, irrespective of whether it's followed with percussion or not. And again, these are signatures which we can find in the uh, EEG signal. And this is how we started out. And we said we should collect about 100 subjects for speech and music. We are still nowhere near there. We have about 40 subjects data, and that will not all domains. So let's look at the speech and the EEG signal. I think this is not very clear. But this is one channel of the EEG signal where we have computed what is called the short-term energy of the signal. This is the same signal. That is what we're doing is we're playing speech through the years and recording the EEG signal simultaneously from all the 120 channels. So we compute the short-term energy here on the speech and also the short-term energy on the EEG signal. Okay, then. As I said, the, the frequencies of interest are from 0.3 to 30 hertz. So 0.3 to 3 hertz corresponds to what is called the delta band. Then you have the theta band. Um, this is what this is. Delta, theta, alpha, beta, gamma. So this covers the entire range over here. You have. Um, 0.3 to 3 hertz, 3 to 5 hertz, uh, 5 to 8, uh, eight uh, 3 to 8 hertz, 8 to 13, 13 to 20, 20 to 30, something like that. I don't remember the exact details. And each of these bands corresponds to different kinds of information. The delta band actually corresponds to what we believe to be phrases in speech. And I can't make out which one this is. This is the theta band, which is supposed to correspond to syllables, and next the beta band, which is of interest for us, corresponds to phonemes in speech. Okay, but if you notice, you will see that the delta band actually down dominates in all these signals. So what we did was, I mean, so you came with after a lot of effort, we subtracted out the delta band from the beta bands, and then we started seeing. I mean, this is a log uh, short-term energy plot, but if you expand this, you start actually seeing syllable-like structure in the signal. What is a syllable? Syllable is the fundamental unit of speech production. Perhaps, if I say, there are two syllables per and haps. Every syllable has a vowel, and it's you know in the context of consonants, and you cannot articulate a consonant in isolation. If you want to say ka with a halanth, you will say ik, but you're actually prefixing it with e. There's always a bubble that is required. So what we thought was first we need to see that kind of structure based on whatever is there in speech production. Can we see it in perception in the EEG signal? And that's what we did. So here is an example. We extract what is called, this is a rod. Uh, I mean, I'll talk about this multi-tickle spectrogram a little later. This is a raw EEG spectrogram, and this is beta minus delta. And if you notice, there are some blanks in between which correspond to the silences, and this is the speech spectrogram. And again, you see blanks which are like silences. Okay, so we start, in fact, we did, I mean, so we didn't come overnight. We spent a tremendous amount of time figuring out, I think it was almost eight months or 10 months of effort before we got to the right feature extraction from the EEG signal for analysis. Okay, that's how it started. So, uh, so finally, this is what we have. This is how speech looks like. And if you look at it, this, this what is a spectrogram is a time dependent spectrum, frequency as a function of time, and that is what was used in speech recognition by our previous Google and so on and so forth. And we said, can we simply, we would like to use similar models for EEG to detect different kinds of sounds, and we start <coughs> seeing that in the beta minus delta, <laughs> but kind of strange. But whereas here you actually start seeing gaps between syllables in the spectrogram of the EEG signal. 
Of course, we use what is called a multi-taper spectrogram. And each time instant, you have a spectrum which corresponds to this red line. There is a Cronox toolbox from Partha Mitra, which in MATLAB, which are able to extract this. And what does it do? This black signal is a standard spectrum. This, those of you who know some little bit of signal processing, but too many side lobes, and you want to suppress it because you primarily want this envelope. And how do we get this envelope? What we do is, this, those of you who know what a sync function is, look, you create a matrix using this. For example, here, K and L, K comma L going from zero to M minus one. This is a symmetric and topless matrix. Then what you want to do is you want to get maximum, this enables maximum, these are called digital flow rate spheroidal sequences. And what we do is we extract the top um, K eigenvectors from this matrix. Then you project the signal along these eigenvectors, compute the Fourier transform, add them, average them, and you choose the parameters for this uh, the additional spheroidal uh, sequences. Omega C is the desired main lobe cut cutoff frequency. T is the sampling rate, and this is what you create. So the EEG processing in terms of spectral analysis, unlike what you do in images or in speech is pretty different, okay? So you, you need to use a multi-taper spectrogram to get something meaningful out of the EEG. And how did we, so I'm just going to give you some results on, um, what we did was, we said, can we do something like syllable level analysis? Because I said, syllable is the fundamental unit of production in speech, and we want to see if perception is also syllable based, okay? So it is believed that we do not listen to every sound that is there. The mapping that is there from we listen to phrases, phrases are made up of words, words are made up of syllables. So the fundamental unit of production is still there. And uh, phrase boundaries, word boundaries, everything occurs at a syllable boundary, okay? So you will not listen to, when I'm talking about the word uh, confabulation, for example, you're gonna to listen to the confabulation entire word. You know, say confabulation. These are four syllables. It, the boundaries will not happen in between words because we do have a vocabulary and there is grammar and so on and so forth. So what we did was, uh, uh, we did what is called syllable level average classification accuracy across 25 syllable, syllables for 12 subjects, and this is unpublished work. And uh, we got an accuracy of 37%. And to just give you an idea how we did this, speech is, the problem, the difference between EEG and speech is, speech is single channel data, primarily a single microphone. EEG is multi-channel data, okay, because you have 128 channels over here. So how do I compare both of them. So what we did was we played the EEG signal, played the speech signal, correct, collected the EEG signal simultaneously. We did a short-term energy on each EEG's channel. It's like some way of doing the multi-taper for that matter, or doing a convolution of various sorts. We created a feature dimension of N with the number of channels used. We used the temporal and parietal lobes. Initially, the boundaries were obtained from speech and the boundaries were iteratively corrected. There are a lot of machine learning algorithms where you do forced alignment to do this. You learn more about it in the machine learning classes. Then we trained models for syllables. We used what is called two-level dynamic programming and hidden Markov models. We did not use deep learning models, which is a state of the art for the primary reason that we do not have enough EEG data. For two-level, there is a, because you need templates for this, we used what are called cross-word reference templates, since utterance is spoken by different people. For example, if I'm saying the same, same sentence, uh, she had your dark suit and greasy wash water all here, which is what we saw in the previous slide here. There are two sentences on which we trained. These sentences are very popular sentences in the speech literature, primarily because they are what are called phonetically balanced sentences. And this gives you, she had your dark suit in greasy wash water all year, gives you the list of syllables that are there. And depending upon who speaks it at what time, even if I speak the same sentence at different time instance, the durations need not be the same. She had your dark suit. She had your dark suit. I can speak like that. And we have to take care of all that in speech. And the same problem will also be there 
in EEG. So the crossword templates, for example, we need to get a single template here. And therefore, we did what are various kinds of alignments to get one common template for all the syllables that are there. And testing was performed on unseen data. And that is what we have reported here. We have only, you know, I must tell you, in speech recognition, um, your CD or Google or whatever it may be, use about 128,000 hours of speech data. We don't have that kind of data. Each of these sentences lasts about uh, two, two, two to three seconds. And we play it a number of times to the subject, five times or something that we play. And the subject gets tired within a few times itself. That's a big problem. You stop listening. So there's a big problem for us in EEG because you need multiple trials because there's a lot of noise that is there to get signatures. You need multiple trials, but when you do multiple trials, even if different speakers, we got different, we had five speakers who spoke the sentences. Nevertheless, you very quickly switch off. It's a big problem when we collect passive data for that matter. And we did this, and that's what gave us the 37% uh, accuracy using these algorithms. So then, um, as I already said, the biggest problem that we started noticing was that for any task, we wanted something like a left, rota left you know, wrist rotation, right wrist rotation. We wanted to see if you can recognize, when you're looking at a particular word, yes and no, can we distinguish between the EEG signatures? We found this was simply not working for a two-class problem even. We got a 50% accuracy, which you could have tossed and got anyway. You don't need a classifier or EEG for that matter. Then we realized that possibly there is a lot of subject information in the given signal, and that's when we did. We said, okay, first thing that we need to do in the EEG signal is perhaps to get rid of the subject information, okay? So we said, first, first of all, does the EEG signa signal have signatures of people, okay? I wish this were Indian names, but nevertheless. Alice, Bob, Carol, and Dave, or whatever, and they're wearing the EEG net, and the objective is you take the EEG signal and you perform EEG-based subject identification, okay? So this was, the, uh, this was the task that we took up. I must tell you, initially, we had horrible results. So normally, what there is, it's not that subject ID has not been done in the literature. People use a specific elicitation protocol and the same session. That is, you make this person watch video, same type of video again and again, and you have, take some of the data for training, some of the data for testing, and then you perform subject identification. But we felt this is kind of meaningless, because if I want to do a vocabulary-based speech recognition system, I need to ensure that it works for new vocabulary that might be there. So I need to get rid of the subject information irrespective of the task that the person is doing, okay? Does not matter whether you're doing anything. Yesterday, for example, Wang told us the good thing about auditory cortex is always awake. It's always listening. So it does not matter. You're supposedly sleeping, but you're still listening, okay? So can we find subject characteristics? And that is what we attempted to do. And I must say we have been reasonably successful in this context. So this is just to give you an idea that what we are uh, doing is not fooling anyone. There's a subject, one subject, and also it should be session independent. This trial one, trial two, trial three in the same session of one subject, same subject, session two. And this is another subject, session one, the picture of the head. I talked to you about the, uh, I gave you a map of the EGI, right? The signals that have been picked up. You just need to look at the image patterns that you have. And clearly, these image patterns are quite close to these. Similarly, these are quite close to this. Okay? So we said this is what perhaps, and that's, what, that's the first thing that we did, to say are their subject signatures. And notice that the sessions are different. You come after three days, after four days, come back. And we may give you the same stimulus, we may give you a different stimulus. Okay? This is what we did. And... Um, and the model that we used is what is called, which is, I mean, we, what we did was we simply borrowed ideas from the uh, uh, speech technology literature, and um, you, we built 
which is the state of the art is what is called a UBM GMM with I vector or whatever it may be. And the idea is just very quite simple. What we believe is the subject space, if you look at the representation in a higher dimensional space, when you're looking at the EEG signal across all signals, there is a subset of the space that corresponds to the EEG signals. And in this subspace, you have different subjects. So what we do is we first create that subspace, which is called a universal background model, where we take as many subject data as possible. Okay? It's not required that all the subjects that you use in uh, training are present. Some subjects may not even be present during training. And then you build this universal background model and we build what is called a Gaussian mixture model. And to give you an idea what a Gaussian mixture model is, it's like a clustering that is there and it says there are so many different templates. What are these templates like? To give you an idea, you go to a store, you want to buy a trouser, you look for a particular height and a waist. Okay? And all of us lot to do, or you know, you buy a t-shirt, small, medium, large, XL, XXL, whatever. You know, Charak Deen has many, many XLs to fit the Indian audience. And you can go and pick up the thing that fits you closest. And that's exactly what this is doing. It's finding a set of template clusters corresponding to subject information in a very high dimensional space. Okay? That's what we did. And then what we did was once this model was built, then you take subject-specific data, and there's something called uh, maximum a posteriori uh, probability-based adaptation. And let's say that the subject feature vectors come near these clusters, these clusters move a little bit, and that gives you the characteristics of the specific subject. So there is one universal reference, and with respect to the reference, you build models for each one of the subjects. Okay, that's what we did. And uh, here are some results that we had. And um, we used um, this testing on 40 different subjects, and we built K nearest neighbor, actual neural network, UBM, GMM, and so on. UBM, GMM has given the best results, especially when you find that the, um, when you do intercession testing, the neural network, because we did not have enough data, it simply learned patterns. Yesterday, as uh, Deepresh Reyes Patas Mitra was talking about, it's like interpolating a, you know, a set of points with a polynomial, n points, n minus one degree polynomial. It goes through every point, and that's exactly what it did. And then we found that, depending upon, we could use different durations of data. Of course, for small amount of data, UBM GMM does not work very well. The artificial neural network works a little bit better because it's trained very closely, and then you find that with larger amounts of data generally across this, you find that UBM GMM model works quite well. The state of the art in speaker verification is what's called I-vector framework, and using the DNNs, there's something called an X-vector framework, and we have modified this. This is yet unpublished work. I'm not presenting it today. Okay, this is a paper that was published in Interspeech in 2018 recently. Okay. So that was about subject identification. Another very big problem in the EEG signal is artifacts. I close my eyes, open my eyes, okay? I mean, generally, when you're listening to audio, you want to close your eyes. But when I'm watching video, I want you to open your eyes, but you'll blink, okay? Then we said, we need to detect these and try and see if you, if you can figure out, okay, in this part of the signal, there is an artifact. So ignore that part of the signal. How do we detect it? So that's what we started looking at. But then we said, as a byproduct, what we did was we uh, had this paper again as interspeech where we said, can we somehow use this eye blink to gainfully use? So what we did was, we, there was a single channel EEG apparatus. This costs about 11,000 rupees. Person's wearing it on the head. There's a reference here. There's one um, EEG electrode over here. And we simply did a navigation and uh, through a keyboard of sorts. Then it does uh, a prediction of the words that you might have. It does word prediction just like a T9 predictor for that matter, which is there in any cell phone for that. And then it synthesizes speech and produces the speech output. Okay? We pass it through text-to-speech synthesis our backyard, and we 
once these words have, once these uh, words have been formed, you can do word to phrase, and once the word to phrase is formed, you pass it through text to speech sensor system to produce a speech. The communication from here is via Bluetooth. The EEG signal is captured. It's sent via Bluetooth to an ordinary Android phone, which has this app running. Then you create words and sentences, and it synthesizes the output. Then, of course, uh, that is when we realize this: there are not only eye blinks, this head nod, moving head from side to side, jaw movements. And right now, we are at this is where we are. We have not had much success with this. So this is the signature for eye blink across subjects. This is the signature for head nod across subjects. And um, this is the uh, signature for head turn across subjects. And this is the signature for jaw movement across subjects. So what we did was we did a very, very controlled experiment. It's almost like a ridiculous experiment, but nevertheless. But we had to figure this out. So we, um, for, we asked people to keep quiet for not do anything for two seconds. There's an instruction given, now blink your eyes, <laughs> close your eyes, open your eyes, move your head, and so on. Then you record the artifact, and then say, then you afterwards you uh, ask the person to silence. Uh, three seconds is given within which the person should do eye blink or uh, whatever. You can do multiple eye blinks. And then we excise these and try to use a dynamic time warping algorithm. It has some interesting results, and we're able to detect it in a single trial. That's a good thing. But I'm not uh, absolutely, um, I mean, it's still very, very nascent. But this is something which is very important because EEG, you have to get rid of the artifacts that are there because you want a person to do things. I can't say, you know, close your eyes and, you know, think. No. Close your eyes and think, your mind is wandering. So I might have, want you to keep your eyes open, but I need to get rid of these artifacts from the EEG signal when you're performing any kind of action, be it listening or imaginary speech. I'm imagining that I want to say yes. Somebody asks you a question, you can't speak. I want to imagine I'm speaking yes. I want to imagine that I'm speaking no. I want to imagine a complete sentence. What do you see? And I say, OK, I see an audience with 170 people. I'd like to say that. But I cannot tell you to do it under very constrained uh, situations. So we need to get rid of these artifacts. These are some of the artifacts that we have seen, and we're trying to do, build a classifier to do this. This is just an idea how we do it. Uh, dynamic time warping is a dynamic programming-based algorithm. It's an ancient algorithm. It came before what are called the hidden Markov models, sequence-to-sequence -sequence models today. And very, very long time ago. And the idea is to match two sequences of data. And that's what we try to do. Because when you look at the EEG signatures, you would have seen that across time, they had somewhat similar patterns. And that's what we did for each one of the uh, artifacts that we looked at. But these are very, very controlled experiments. And there is also overemphasis, because it's like acting. You know, Whereas when a person is normally speaking, I blink, it'll be a brief blink. <laughs> So it may not show up as well either. So this is something that we need to look at. Um, the next, some of the successes that we did was another experiment was on the oddball paradigm. So basically, you have a beep, which is a standard beep, 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 you know, uh, coo, 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 you do, and make a slightly different sound. And does the person detect? There's something called a P300 wave, which is a positive, positive going signal. And normally, in the literature, what people have done, this is very, very commonly used in psychology research, subjects are presented with a sequence of repetitive stimuli. This repetitive stimuli is inter interrupted by presenting an infrequent one. And the objective is to detect, did they see that infrequent stimulus? And when did it occur? And normally, the P3, it's called the P300, because it, you can detect it after 300 a maximum of 300 milliseconds after the stimulus has been presented. This is an example of the oddball paradigm. So you have monkeys, and the oddball is your flowers. So you had the monkeys, which were many pictures, and you had the flowers, which came occasionally. The oddball there is your flower. And ideas, do you see, hey, this is not, does not belong to this group. And why is it single trial important? Because I can't, as I already said, when I ask somebody, somebody to repeat a trial, to really get tri tired, you know, it'll just pass on and you will have no activity at all. This is how the EEG signal looks across trials. If I average it out, 
You know, this is, I must tell you, uh, this experiment was someone, was done by someone who had a lot of interest in this experiment, okay? And then you will actually see the activity over here by a P300 kicking in, and the idea is to detect this. But the point is, I want to detect it on each one of these individual traces, not on the average trace, because this is like 25 trials for average, okay? So then um, what we did was, um, this is where machine learning did help, we have what is called a baseline uh, deep neural network model, which uses 1D convolution. You'll hear more about machine learning models. And um, you take um, each frame of data, and you perform, you have two convolutional layers, fully connected layers, and the output. This is the state of the art. To this, what we did was we said, uh, the EEG signal has both, um, has temporal information and spatial information. So we did what is called, so we take the spatial information because nearby electrodes could capture the same signal. So you keep doing this, collect these frames, stack them. And we did what is, we performed. The input is a 3D signal to this convolution network. It's a three-dimensional convolution network. We again have two layers. We did average pooling, rather normally max pooling is done, those of you who know a little bit about deep neural networks. We did average pooling because we felt nearby guys will have some information. Then there's a fully con connected layer at the end. You flatten it out, do a sigmoid, and you detect the task. Detect whether the odd event occurred or not. When did the odd event occur? Does it find the odd event? Then we replace this with what's called convolutional LSTMs. Um, convolutional, um, you know, um, the LSTMs give you what is called long-term information. One gives spatial, other gives temporal. So can we somehow, but the problem is, if you did fully convolutional, the number of parameters becomes humongous. So you replace them, the dense layer that is there the, in the LSTM, with a, I'm sorry, if you do LSTMs, it becomes extremely uh, large number of parameters. So you replaced it with a convolutional LSTM, which essentially means you reduce the number of parameters. You learn more about this again, hopefully in the uh, machine learning classes. So these are the EEGs, goes through the convolution here. Then you flatten it out. Then you go through a sigmoid and detect whether it saw the odd event or not. And um, we've done, we have collected locally data. We did primarily for, uh, this was subject specific over here. And there's also an uh, online data set, uh, which is available, which is on 64, this is our 128 channel data set. There's also a 64 channel data set that's available. And this is on the online data set. If you notice, there are various models, each one of them seeming to be different variants of the convolutional neural network. And we have found that the, um, this is false negatives, true negatives, and so on. And we do, it's not totally clear, but we do seem to think that the uh, standard 1D convolution plus the convolution 3D convolution LSTM performs better. We have a little more handle on our own data set, and this seems to perform pretty well. The, I'm sorry, in our case, for example, we found the baseline plus the um, convolution neural network 3, 3D giving you much better accuracies. So there are, but one of the things that we did find was the spatial information was very important in this particular task, okay? Um, I have another 15 minutes and I think I should be able to finish this it's on two different subjects that we did. And um, so that this is a, the oddball paradigm is again a very important point as I again repeat, when a ev sudden event occurs, then is there something that we can do to say, hey, the EEG has kicked in, so possibly there is an event in the stimulus that you're looking at. So can it feed back to the machine learning models is something that we are very keen to look at. And finally, we did um, what are called motor and mental activity. You're moving your wrist or imagine movement of the wrist and the uh, mental activity, we ask people to count. Simple reverse counting, skip of two reverse counting. So we wanted to distinguish between the two of them. Left fist, 
right fist movement. We use what is called, again here, I must tell you, know, this is one thing that we have to keep our eyes open. If you notice, we are jumping from multi-taper spectrogram, short-term energy, uh, convolutional neural networks, whatever, but you have to keep your eyes open to see what techniques are available. We use what are called, because it's a two-class problem, we use what are called common spatial patterns method to extract discriminative features from the EEG data. And how does it do it? And then, once we extracted the features, we built a UBM GMM, which we already talked about, adapted it for each one of them. And the idea is essentially that uh, if you take each trial, it, you have n number of channels, and t is the time of the sample length. You compute what are called sample covariance matrices using this. Uh, this, this is quite normal, OK? Normalized covariance matrices for the two tasks. And um, then what we do is, what is different about this is, you create a new matrix, both are symmetric, so you add both of them, and you'll get a symmetric matrix again. Then you factorize it, okay, using principal component or single value decomposition or whatever. Then you create what is called a whitening transformation, which is projected. And then what is interesting is the way this, um, you convert it, what we started out with C, for example, you again do a decomposition on this, and it, the decomposition is such that the uh, motor movement and um, reverse counting movements, the covariance matrices add up to one. Therefore, if you look at the eigenvalues of the sigma m, if it is large, <coughs> sigma r should be small. So large, eigen, large variance direction corresponds to smaller variance, and if the um, eigenvalues of this matrix are small, the other one should be large. So that's how we distinguish between the two classes. So that's what we did. So you can project along the top variance eigenvalues for detecting one class and the lower variance eigenvalues for the other class. So you project the data along these directions. That is your new feature vector. Then you can use a classical machine learning algorithm to detect between the two tasks. So this is what we did. I'm not going to go in through the details. All of the stuff is available in this paper. and. As I already said, maximum variance, minimum variance components, because they sum to one, minimum variance component for one means maximum variance for the other. That's precisely what we did. This is what is called a uh, common spatial pattern-based approach for classification of AEGs. For a two-class problem, we again used a UBM GMM, and we uh, classified the two tasks. But there was a problem with this technique that we used. Primarily because it required that all the subjects for whom we did this mental motor classification be seen during training. So then what we did was, and then the accuracies were not high. So we said, can we do a little better? Can we use little data from the subject? Does not matter, the subject is not seen during training. This is done in speech recognition all the time. A Google Mini or an Alexa, when you start using it, you'll find that it's getting better. Why, how does it get better? Because it actually adapts to your voice. Siri will ask you to speak. Google will say, say, OK, Google. That's the simplest that it does. And then as you keep learn, as you keep using the system, it keeps training better and better for your voice. So we did the same thing for subject-based classification of motor mental activity. We used a universal background model adapted for each subject. And um, then we found that the classification accuracies became much, much better with two minutes. Two minutes is the adaptation that we did. There are different um, kinds of um, hierarchical classifiers that we have built, motor, mental, then left, right, and so on. And we find that the accuracies are, have uh, subject-specific models results in an absolute improvement of one to seven percent for unseen as unseen subjects too, the adapted performance models perform much better than the baseline systems. So this is, so what I have talked to you is about, I come to the end of my uh, uh, lecture now. So as I said, these are very nascent experiments. As you would have seen, many of them are still unpublished results. EEG signals are difficult to process. They are pretty noisy. Even for the same subject across sessions, the signals are not necessarily similar. 
and I have to tell you that depends upon your mood on that day. Are you ready to take this test? Okay, and that's why psychologists make you do a large number of tests so that they can average it out. But if I want to use EEG as a brain-computer interface, it must happen on one trial. I'm trying to do something, and then you get quite frustrated, and you know if you get agitated, your EEG signal could get messed up, and the problem is the data is very sparse. So we need both signal processing and innovative machine learning algorithms. Although you know, I gave you a scattered set of examples, for each one of them, we have tried standard machine learning algorithms, standard signal processing, nothing worked. Then my students and I have worked together continuously. We actually stare at the signal a lot. Stare at the signal, stare at the spectrum, do some processing, keep looking at it, and what I am presenting to you is only the successes. The failures have been 99%. These are all 1% success stories that we are actually showing. But nevertheless, the important point is the results that we have presented here are promising, and perhaps we can use EEG signals you know, to perform various tasks, okay? and especially ultimately build brain-computer interfaces. I mean, so it's a long shot because we showed one example of speech sensors, but uh, what we have done in the lab is 128 channel, and that equipment costs some 50, 60 lakhs, and I've spent all my life savings in IIT on that particular equipment. So the challenge is to build a low-cost EEG system which can be used. I don't want to wear a whole helmet. Maybe I'm only looking at speech. Okay, so can you look at only the temporal cortex and parietal cortex? Can we build, um, you know, uh, electrodes that sit there, collect the data, communicate via Bluetooth maybe to your cell phone, enable you to do various activities? Thank you very much.